guys i am so excited for today's live um how are you guys doing how has your side of the world been today we have jessica scott who is joining us um she is a life coach for highly sensitive women excuse the cars like my my room is like right next to the road um and she helps women heal and break um some of the issues from their pasts um and i love the fact that her bio says multi-generational um you know sort of pain and stuff like that so um off the off last yesterday's live i wanted to talk about what we need to do to go inward so hey how are you hi how are you i'm well thank you thank you so much for joining me you have no idea i'm i like have like uh, um what they call it you know when you 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 become nervous for famous people that's how i feel with you and i very really feel like that <laughs> Um, how's things been? We've been following one another for a while now, right? I mean, like, yeah, yeah. I think I've been following you since Scarlett was like two. Mm -hmm. It's been a long time. Yeah. Uh, how are things on that side with uh, COVID nineteen? I know you stay a little away from the city, so you're not very exposed to all of the things happening there. Um. So her, Scarlett's dad lives downtown Chicago, so when yeah. we're down there. It's completely different because it's kind of like a ghost town. It looks. much like the uh, scenes of the walking dead you know like no yeah. one's around so it's completely different than when i'm out here i mean i kind of live in the middle of nowhere and so mm -hmm. it doesn't seem all that different and i work from home so um that even more lends itself to me kind of living in my own little blinders on world yeah yeah i i think I, I, you like have the perfect set up with regard to the fact that you already work at home and you already have right. kind of this um how can i say sheltered environment as opposed to those of us who literally live like 5 minutes from the city and the craziness is all around us we see it like all the time um so like today's topic was going inward and the reason i wanted to talk to you about that was i've watched you evolve from being someone who was so into fitness um you know so into coaching people about fitness to really finding who you truly were and i mean that that is most of what i talk about as well but i, I there were moments that i think for, for in your journey that have really stood out to me um the kitchen moment was like a big thing for me because i i i noticed at the time that you were really quiet for a while and then you spoke about it i was like yes i know that I know that experience you know and I think we all need one of those moments that kind of just wake us up to the realness of who we actually are. Um I want you to just tell a little bit of that story and how you ended up getting to that point in your life. Great question. So this kitchen moment um wow, it came after this moment where I had been doing fitness for a long time. I was a fitness coach, coach women online and I had been in uh like com competing i had done competitions yeah and so that kind of started this like voracious appetite for like bettering myself and bettering yeah. myself always came with uh the outside appearance mm. um it's it's such a weird thing to grow up and i'm going to say this completely honestly Um I have a lot of white privilege. I have a lot of um privilege of being close to or the standard of society's ideal of beauty and mm. well that's coveted in our society. Um it's also something that slowly kills the women who are in that group, right? Yeah. Because it becomes how you are defined and how you're known. Mm. And so Um I remember even when Scarlett was younger and I was losing my baby weight something that I never would talk about now because I wouldn't be trying to lose my baby weight I would just try yeah. trying to live in the moment and be my healthiest self that has nothing to do with weight right Um but I remember being like oh my goodness I don't know that I would ever have another baby because I didn't want to ruin my body again Yes right? to this whole huge long struggle with always having to be perfect and struggle with perfectionism black and white tendencies black and white thinking mm. um, which really is a hellish life to be honest there's no ability to um sit in the shit there's no ability to dance with this present moment and that is really both isolating scary and then you don't have any tools to deal with the inevitable failures of life or imperfections right yeah so um i 
worked out. I lost all my baby weight. And it was almost like I was on this endless cycle of trying to be smaller and somehow smaller was equated with better. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm five foot eight. All the people in my family, like you go to a family barbecue, no one is a size zero or two. Like <laughs> no one, right? I mean, there are fit individuals in a straight size, but literally like no one in my family has the genes to just be a size two. Um, yeah. In order to, for me to be that, which I have, I had to consume an inordinate, I had to spend, I should say, an inordinate amount of energy to be that size. So mm. I did that. Um, I was to, like 20, 30 pounds lighter than I am now, and I'm still in a total straight size. So um, it's totally crazy. <laughs> um, but at that point, I got that body that like, I feel a lot of women think if they get that, it's literally and they've made it. Yeah, I, and I've coached women who are single and they're wanting to date, but they think they can't until they lose 15 pounds. Mm. And, um, you know, our beliefs create our lives. So if you have that belief, then you're going to be meeting men who have that belief also, right? Yes. Like and I don't mean it's just change that belief, but we can investigate where did this belief come from, right? Um, mm. Could I possibly date without losing 15 pounds? And then you'd be meeting people who don't care about that 15 pounds, which is great. Um, so I got that Instagram body. I mean, I'm talking like eight pack abs without flexing. Yeah, no, I know. I, I used to watch your, your pictures that you used to post in the bathroom in your underwear. And you were so comfortable like that. And then you did this change um, where there was this realization that I don't necessarily need to do this for anything or for anyone. And I just need to be comfortable in my own skin, however that looks. You know what I'm yeah, saying? And that, that change started when Scarlett was starting to be old enough. I mean, when they're two, you know, they're, they're there, but they're not cognitively processing. Mm -hmm. um, it, obviously, trauma can come in at any point, but they're not aware of what they're seeing. You know, you don't have memories. Yeah. There's actually, a, you know, a part of our brain that's not formed yet for memories. Mm -hmm. um, trauma can be stored in the body, though, still, which is uh, interesting. So she, when she started to be like three, about, she's almost seven, um, three, four, I started watching her watch me and she was aware of what I was doing. And I didn't want her looking in the mirror the way that I had been. And so mm -hmm. that coupled with when I did look in the mirror, I had that body, that like perfect Instagram body. And I, I felt nothing about it. I, I literally thought I would, you know, I don't know if I would hear trumpets playing or have this like, just, I mean, I, I don't know what, I don't know what I No, I get that. <laughs> gym started to be like, I didn't have fun anymore. Like, cause I was so chasing that perfect body. And then like, I had it and I was like, gym's not fun. Nothing was fun. Mm -hmm life wasn't any better and if anything I was so stressed out trying to maintain that and I would think about food and I would you know salivate about food and I mean there's even studies that they've done on the Minnesota starvation experiment if you've never heard about it um really really insightful but they there's a thing in there that study called nutrition masturbation yeah and it's not actually involving sexual acts yeah but it's like when you're so ingrained in diet culture and when you're so focused on food and how much you eat and you're using you're eating at a calorie deficit most mm. times you look at like food porn like we've heard that mm. before and i've done that before when i was competing you like look on pinterest at all these salivating uh recipes and that's a cue you know now like I mean, if someone sends me a picture, I'd be like, okay, but I never think about food. I'm never, I mean, unless I'm like getting a hunger cue, you know, I'm not like pining after food. Yeah. I'm ruining my life for other things. So there was this time where I was looking in the mirror, felt nothing. Scarlett was seeing me look in the mirror. I didn't want to do that anymore. And then I had this moment, it was in the kitchen at the old house we lived in, not this one, we just built this and moved in. Yeah. Um, where... I was just overcome with emotion. I was literally on my knees on the kitchen floor um, crying. And I felt such a connection to 
my inner light in that moment. And I knew that like the inner light that was here to, you know, help women and take them on a journey and be a yeah. bridge to meeting them in the abyss that most times I meet women in. It had nothing to do with our outer appearance. Let me just mm. I mean, it was so clear, you know, like I, um, and I'm, I'm thankful for it. And I, I don't chastise myself anymore for that portion of my life. But yeah. it was just, it was almost laughable. Like, I'm, it's like, oh my God, it's so much more than that, right? Mm. So down the rabbit hole to this inner journey um, of becoming kind of what I say is like my highest self instead of my past self, which is a collection of personality ideas of that mm. I, I thought I had to be, right? We all have these things that we think we had to be. Yes. And I thought I had to be perfect, look perfect, act perfect, be perfect, be the prettiest, be the thinnest, have the best body. Um, I, I, I could go on and on about where this came from, but when I yeah. start to look at these beliefs, our beliefs create our life, you know? Mm. And um, our beliefs, though, they're not consciously chosen. I wish, I wish at 10 we could go into a beliefs room and just pluck out what we want. Um, that would be really nice. But in actuality, it, that's not how it happens. Yeah. Right? It's unconscious programming from our, our family of origin, you know, from our society too. And so, you know, yes, our, belief, our mind and our thoughts create our world. But before that happens, our environment creates our mind. Yes. And so this beautiful, you know, it's healing trauma. It's becoming self-aware. And this whole journey of why the heck do I do what I do? <laughs> you know, I question myself about that every day because I feel like most of us only really have to, we have to have like something happen for us to recognize that this, there's actually more to this world than the external, more to it than we think we're supposed to be and this perfect, perfect life. Um, and from, for me, I thought it meant um, at some point, you know, th like you said, the trumpets are going to sing from all the things I'd achieved in my life. But then I got to a point in my life where it's like, I haven't achieved the things I thought I was going to achieve with my life, but it's actually going in a completely different direction. Maybe I should yeah. be looking a little deeper into why it's going into that direction. So mm -hmm. um, you talk about um, helping women deal with generational uh, uh, pain and, and the kind of things that kind of hold them back from the things that they want to do in their life. I, I had a conversation with a friend of mine yesterday about this and what I want to know, what do you think the reason is we fall back on those um, hard times or those pains or bad behaviors that continue the cycle of just not really going anywhere um, with our spiritual lives and our emotional state? Yeah, this is a really good question. And it's one that we can ask one of two ways. We can ask it with self-compassion and self-compassion when we're present with an empathetic listener, a safe person, you know, like a therapist setting or if yeah. we're acting like a therapist to ourselves, right? Um, if it's a gentle questioning, then it allows um, the defenses to drop, right? But if mm -hmm. I were to be like, why do you do that? What are you going to defend? Like become resistant, you know, so yes. So the first step is when doing this work, it requires an immense amount of compassion. Otherwise, you literally can't see it, right? Yeah. So in order to be a, a witness to yourself, you really have to start making sure you're asking the question because trust me, I've been there a million times. Why the hell would I think that my body, you know what I mean? And this creates um, like a beating up against yeah, instead yeah. of a, a, a gentle opening, right? I mean, if you try to open a flower by, why the, what, what's in here, you know? Or yeah. you gently peel back and that's how we are. So first know we're very defended against our, you know, vulnerabilities, our deeper yeah. side issues, challenges. So first compassion. Second is to know that I love having the explanation that anything that you do, um, a coping mechanism, I work out a lot, I self-harm, I fill in the blank, I drink, I, you know, whatever your I fill it in, I feel stress and then I do this. Um, it was a learned coping mechanism for mm. a time which you needed it, 
right? Yes. So we're always, we're, we're such intelligent creatures. We don't do things without a payoff, right? Mm. And once again, it's like, invite the compassion in. I was doing all of that, running on the treadmill of life for a payoff, right? And so when I could see, when was, when did I first kind of start this behavior? Well, in seventh grade, I first started my first diet. Um, I was coping with a lot of, you know, changes in my body that no one, no one ever talked to me about being a woman. No one ever talked to me about, um, like, I remember I had, uh, I still have the way my body is shaped. I have a a smaller waist, but instead of having like saddlebags, like at the lower part of your flank area, I get kind of like the muffin top type thing, which I hate. I'm just trying to explain it. Yeah, so yeah. my body has always been set up like this. Even when I'm my leanest, that's where I have a little bit of extra fat. And I remember when I started doing, going through puberty in the dressing room, like I would be like, oh my God, I would call my fat bubbles. And like my mom would, you know, you're not fat, you don't have fat, you know, but there was no um, kind of, I mean, I would have taken Scarlet under my wing and said like, your body is changing. You're, you're starting to be a woman. And this is yeah. what this means. And, you know, I actually was looking at the CDC guidelines because Scarlett is a bigger girl. She, her dad is 6'2", I'm 5'8". She's way off the charts as far as weight and height is. Yeah. And I saw on the guidelines that women, and I didn't even know this until just last week, gain weight throughout high school, still after they graduate, like five pounds a year leveling off at 21. That's like the child's growth cycle. It's levels off. All right, so... Okay, I don't think it's at the level one. I'm sorry. sorry. It levels off. (laughs) I don't ever remember it leveling off. (laughs) Yeah, so like, like no one ever told. I was at 21 trying to be like my 13 year old weight. Mm. Right, like I we're always like pining, like oh my god. Well, at 16, I mean, I was 120 pounds or whatever, and I was like. Well, you're 40 now, or <laughs> whatever. Oh, no, you're 25 now. You're not 16. So yeah. Um. Anyways, getting back to what you were saying. Um. What was the original question? I went on this whole diatribe. <laughs> um. I wanted to know, like, from from the pain of 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 the generational pain and the pain that they yes. came from. Um. Why okay. are we so resistant to the healing? Yeah. Yeah. So, great. So, all of that explanation was to say you start doing a behavior that you still do when you need that behavior for survival. So even if it was completely made up in my mind, which there was an aspect that wasn't because I got a lot of love from my parents and from my teachers when I was perfect. I was a straight A student. I was the MVP of my volleyball teams. I was this, I was that. Um, So that to me was like inextricably linked and tied to love, right? So Mm. I'm like, in order to get more love, I'm going to do more of that. Yes. Whatever we start doing to cope in childhood, whether it's with an, an immense amount of pain and there's so much sexual trauma or physical trauma and abuse, or if it's just emotional trauma or relational trauma, there's not a lot of emotional intelligence in your household. Whatever we do in order to cope with pain as a child, that is what we link to survival and we keep going back to as an adult. So anything that you're like, why the hell do I do this? I can't even believe I do this. The compassion then needs to be present to know that whatever this is, it served you in a huge way. Otherwise you mm-hmm. would not be doing it. And so um, Gabber, Dr. Gabor Mate is someone that I am getting a certification through right now, but he has this uh, approach called compassionate inquiry. And he has an example where if you and I went to Antarctica we would be freezing, right? So yeah. we put out a lot of clothes. I'd have a ski mask and gloves and, you know, that would serve us really well, obviously, so we don't die. Yeah. You and I then were transported to the tropics somewhere, same clothing. We would be sweating and nearly dying. Yeah. So the process of going inward and starting to awaken is, wow, like noticing what clothing you're wearing figuratively not literally Mm. right it's like what oh i i'm i still have that ski mask on and i'm not in antarctica anymore right okay so hence is like this isn't serving me you know like i have a a way that like i've been working on like i snap real quick 
you know, I'll snap and say something nasty at Scarlett or, you know, my, res my initial response to Rick might be not as loving as I would like. Yeah. So instead of me being like, I'm so fucked up, what's wrong with me? I'm such an idiot. I'm such a loser. You know, this type of talk. Then when we start to go in and we say like, there's something about that that served me at some point. Mm. So if I'm starting to look at it as I'm a brilliant, magnificent, intelligent creature, what was that? How was that my best attempt to solve a pain, solve an issue? And now with the self-awareness, I start to notice in the present moment, I want to snap and say something nasty, but I don't need that same response, right? Mm -hmm. It's almost like we moved to the tropics. We're so used to putting on snow pants, but right before you put on snow pants, you're like, actually, this doesn't serve me anymore. I'm going to choose something different. Yeah. It's, it's like we're saying you have to peel back all the, the, all, all the layers like an onion. And I mean, this is something I spoke about with a couple of my friends. It comes up in the last two years continually, how important it is to actually recognize these layers that we have piled up onto, onto ourselves to protect ourselves from vulnerable areas that we've never really addressed in our lives. And what I found really key was I was watching a Red Table talk the other day and as I passed on there, he was saying he had no idea how much undealt with issues he had until they were in lockdown and so until he was not able to fly around as often as he did um and how much daddy issues he actually had because he thought working outdoors meant he was providing for his family as opposed to his father who left him as a child um i find that like in an african context it's very difficult for us to even have this kind of conversation because african people don't believe that anything is wrong with them and we always, you know, I always use the Bible scripture, like we take the log out of uh, uh, the, the splinter out of our friend's eye and leave the log in our own because it's easier to help somebody else instead of looking at our own issues. But do you think that, um, and I believe this, but do you think that it is so important to first deal with yourself before you can actually get to the realization of who you are? And in my opinion, your purpose in this life, because we are, we're not here just to float around to do nothing. In, that's what I just think. Right. Um, I wanted to comment on something, and that you're so right. Um, I, I'm, I'm clearly not African, and I'm not African-American, so yeah. I don't know, and I have a completely different upbringing. But what I've seen and what I've learned throughout my studies is that, um, you know, some of the most traumatized individuals in the world or in this nation are the, the most defended. It's just exactly what we talked about. Mm. You have to be so defended against vulnerability because in the past vulnerability, whether or not it was in this generation or past, um, trauma is inherited. It actually, it, it's passed down in genes. So, I mean, even, I mean, I, I don't have any black blood in me, so I'm completely white, but you know, even just the trauma of, you know, my mom, her mom died when she was five and her dad died when she was 15 talk about trauma. Yeah. You know? I mean, I, I, I literally like, can't even imagine that. And then mm. her parents were uh, first generation, came over from Sicily. So I also don't know what kind of trauma that is, you know? Yeah. I mean, my mom grew up not wealthy, not even middle class. Like, you know, these are, these, if you're wondering where your meal is going to come from or not having a lot, um, you know, this is trauma. And mm. so when you talk about, you know, like your culture or Africans, they don't realize there's even a plank in their eye. There has to be some sort of avenue of self-awareness for that to happen. And the more defended we are against this inquiry, um, then you're not going to see it, right? It's just yeah. exactly how I was explaining it. If I'm like, why the hell am I like defended, 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 you know? Um, so it, it kind of just goes with the territory and this is where it's like, how do you start to help, um, rehabilitate and heal an entire cohort of people yes. who are so immensely traumatized, mm. uh, historically, um, this is the real challenge because you can't even help you, that you can't help someone unless they want to be helped, but they don't want to be helped because they've been so hurt. So, yeah. you know, this, it's this huge cycle. I think that is my biggest struggle because the whole reason that I do these lies and why I've had this owning this life is 
in our culture, so we have the different races, right? And as much as we have a democracy in our country, we are so very segregated in our culture. So we have the white and then the black people, and then we have colored people. Now in America, I would be seen as black, but in South Africa, I'm a colored person. I come with my entire own culture. My issue with colored people in particular is the fact that we are so traumatized by past that we have limited um, the amount that we can do with our lives. So people have jobs and working jobs, whether they're fulfilled or not. Uh, well, most people, as far as I've spoken to, would rather be doing something else. But that fear that I'm not good enough because this is what has been taught to our parents, that they are not good enough, so they need to work in a job. And like you're saying, that generational pain has come down to us. And I see it in the way that my friends are rearing their kids. Even now, no, you need to study to get a job so that you can do this. But there's no point where we're having conversations with our children that talk about who are you within? What are you what are you, your, your internal desires? What are the things you wake up thinking about the first, uh, you know, in the morning? We don't have those innate conversations. I think one of the biggest things for me is I had a conversation with a family member of ours who has four grown sons. And um, I talk very candidly to my kids about sex, specifically because we live in a country where ch uh, uh, child trafficking and all that kind of thing is really high. And I need to be, make sure that they are aware, but not in a sense to kind of make them afraid or anything, but really just be candid about where they are at, where um, what they need to know for now, but at the same time, who they are as individuals and that they don't need to feel like sex is one of those taboo topics. Um, and But also I do it because I would rather have the information come from me than from their friends. So when I had this conversation with uh, the family member, she had never had this conversation with her child. And the thing that I concerned me about it was the fact that the child has social media from the age of 13. He has a cell phone. He has access to basically anything that is out there. Okay. Why we are not getting, I mean, even that, that for me is a basic conversation. So at what point are we going to be having these emotional internal conversations with our children? And I see with you, you're very, open with Scarlett about who she is, why she is the way she is. I love the part about her feeling when she's upset, giving her time and then going after her. And I realized when you, you posted that, I realized I had a trauma in that area because if I felt um, emotional about something, I felt emotionally abandoned as a child by my parents and it translated into my adult life, into my marriage. So if I was upset about something, even now, I had this conversation with my husband a couple of days ago. Um, <laughs> even now as an adult, if he doesn't address how I'm feeling or come to me, I feel emotionally abandoned. So mm -hmm. in saying all of that, my question is how important is it to be aware that our children, can't, uh, we, we kind of intrinsically are, are handing down our traumas from our childhood to our children if we're not aware of the kind of conversations we need to be having with them and allowing them just to feel, you know, especially when they're going through puberty, they have a lot of feelings. I have a 13 year old, they are days. But, um, well, the you know. First, the first step, I think, um, just to start to like whet your appetite about this type of thing, especially if it's new to you, because this might be like taking people down. <laughs> I don't know how, you know, astute your followers are in this type of work. Um, but sometimes when you begin, um, it can feel so overwhelming. Like, where do you start? Yes. Um, and this next question is not, not overwhelming, but it's a good one. When you were younger and you were feeling heavy feelings, which no one is impervious to, right? Yeah. So whatever, you were 14 crying about a boy or you, whatever, you were in your room crying or wherever you would go cry. Who came? Nobody. Right. And so how did that make you feel? And most people, if they've repressed the feeling, they won't be able to answer it in a way that elicits um, more growth. But if you were to witness um, a 13 year old, let's say you just could see into someone's family life, uh, something's going on and she's crying in her room. Mm -hmm slinked up in the corner here and she's just beside herself does she want someone to come or does she not and if we say she doesn't want someone to come and she just wants to be left alone then this i would argue 
points to more relational trauma. She doesn't mm. want you to come because she doesn't trust you. So that yes. means that there's something there. Mm. But she, we are not isolated creatures. We're not meant to live alone. I know a lot of us do. I've been a single mom and that was hard. But um, we're not meant to live alone. So the relationship between child and parent is so important. And a lot mm. of times we're looking for like parenting tips and tricks. But like I've never looked for a tip or a trick with my best friends. Why? Because at the helm, at the absolute pinnacle of what is important between me and my best friends is the relationship. I'm always preserving the relationship. Yes. How are we relating to each mm. other? For some reason, it's like, oh, this is a child. And it's like, I've got to do something weird. No, we're 100% of the time, we need to be preserving relationship. This does yes. not mean that in that preservation limits rules, boundaries, directing, teaching is thrown out the window. Yeah. Conversely, the only way you could teach, guide, oh, scared me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you wanna bring it in here? Yeah. Scarlett has a meeting with her school and right now and like, yeah, I'm trying to do both at once so I might have to click on a meeting. No, it's fine, the it's only fine. Way, thank you, the only way um, that we're going to Give me just a second. Click on this. There you go. And then join. Join now that green one. Okay. Um, I may have lost my train of thought. So the only way that we're going to start to see this is to start to treat our children by preserving the relationship. Yes. Um, if someone doesn't want you, if there's an inability to communicate, then there's been a severing in the attachment. Mm -hmm. So instead of directing or hounding, we need to go back in and collect our children to us so that we can be there to direct. So you kind of have to have them close to you in order to direct them at all. Otherwise it's like, yeah, yeah right, I'm not listening to you type of thing, you know? No, I, you know, I relate so 100% to that because that is the basis of my parenting. I, I wasn't reared that way. So my belief is always the relationship with my children trumps anything else. Of course, there's going to be discipline, but I need to maintain that relationship because that's the only way I can safely guide them, you know, in, a, in, 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 in sort of their purpose direction, because that is the goal for me and my kids, not what I want or any of those things. And I, I've learned that the hard way with my teenager. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so we're going to do this for forever because yo, you're speaking life to me. So in closing, I, I, I want to talk about um, how do we actually go inward? Because we talk a lot about this it's all over social media. We see all of these gurus who are doing lives and all of that. But for some of us, and for me, I know you were talking about how overwhelming this can be when you start. I, I know that overwhelm. Um, so how do we actually start by doing this? And what are the, do you think the key things is that we need to look at in ourselves to address first? Oh, this is a great question. This is where I do think that having someone to help facilitate this journey, um, it has to be a safe place. It has to be someone trusted because someone who's unsafe can really inject a lot of um, unsafe practices. I've been a part of that. I've uh, been a part of communities where, you know, the, the leader or the guru is um, really preying on people's vulnerable states. I'm pulling my face because that's happened to me twice. Yeah, same. So um, when we're looking for, uh, this is what we need to be looking for. Someone who has your best interest in mind um, mm. A coach who feels safe, is safe, isn't telling you who you need to be, um, isn't shaming you or yeah. purposefully triggering you. Um, I've been a part of these spiritual communities and this is complete and utter, and I'm going to say it, bullshit. Because when someone is triggering you on the outside purposefully, I've been a part of arenas where it's like, oh, I'm doing this so you can heal. And it's like, no one should be doing that. Instead, in a safe place, what you should be doing is bringing a trigger to the conversation to work on in a safe place, yeah. right? So I don't trigger Scarlett so she can learn, right? Yeah. Instead, 
I look at what is triggering her in my environment, what's upsetting her, what's going on, and now I can attach to her and we can safely work on it together. So um, the first step is start to become aware, right? And uh, what is this? What is self-awareness, right? Mm. So for someone who's like just beginning, um, what this looked like in me, and I like giving examples, is like, okay, why do I have to be that size? Who told me that? And where did I learn that? And this isn't like a punitive question, but it's just kind of like, if I were to just be sitting with my coffee, I just start to say like, what do I get out of that? Yeah. What, what does that bring me that not being that, what does not being that size feel like? Well, it felt unsafe. It felt like rejection. It felt like, um, you know, I'd be treated like fat people are treated. Uh, and ding, ding, ding. You know, maybe, maybe here's some yeah. information, you know? Um, it's really starting to just get curious and be like, and so this is where I was like, well, it would feel like rejection if I was bigger. I wouldn't be the best in that arena. What does that mean? Mm. Where do I start this dieting? And when I'm dieting and hitting those goals, what, it, what is it that I'm trying to achieve? Because the things we try to achieve through our coping mechanisms, even if they're poor choices, are not bad. Someone who's an alcoholic or an addict or someone who, you know, I mean, even like domestic violence or abuse against kids, I'm not yeah. condoning it. I'm saying... Whoever is self-harming, drinking from the bottle, injecting, or whatever they're doing, they're seeking something that is very normal to want. Empowerment, control, a feeling of uh, relief, uh, like worth, relief, stress relief. So the things we're desiring are not um, that bad, right? It's, it's mm. to be expected. So if I'm wanting acceptance, I'm wanting to belong, I'm wanting to people to, you know, applaud for me, do I need, you know, why do I need other people to applaud to, for me? I need to want to applaud for me. Am I here to um, be a certain size? Like if I believe in an afterlife, if I believe in a soul or many lives, did I incarnate and take up space in this body with the sheer will of having an eight pack? That just seems a little silly. That just seems a little bit silly. I love that question. <laughs> you know? so, so that's not it. And I, and I can I could have an eight pack if I want. But what is the overall, like what, if I was so excited for this lifetime before it began, then what was I excited about? It probably mm -hmm. wasn't about an eight pack. So what was it, you know? And this just, this is how, why there's so many layers to the onion. It's not just like, I have never thus far been like, and I'm there, right? <laughs> uh, it's, I, it's like every day, there's such a, um, a, a deeper awareness. When yes. you get to a certain level, um, I do work, uh, practice inquiry sessions, like practice therapy sessions with uh, my cohort for training. And we bring triggers to the surface. And it's so funny because you think after years and years of doing this work, you're like, oh, I, I'm good. You know, I, I was just going to say right that, guru. like, I was just going to say, like, you know, you have a trigger that you thought you dealt with and then next year rolls around and it comes in a different form. And you realize this is actually more layered than it initially looked. So I need to actually realize that this might never be completely gone from my life. And I may have to deal with different aspects of it as I develop in my, you know, internal growth and all of that. Right. And so I'll, br I'll bring up like a little insignificant trigger, like some little thing. And I'm like, I can't even believe it. After all these years, I'm still getting, you know, I had some little trigger. This is hilarious. It was like a little thing, like Rick used my water bottle. He doesn't even know about this. He doesn't watch Instagram videos, so um, <laughs> he used my water bottle without asking. Like, I, I really don't care. But I got a little bit like, oh, he's using my water bottle? Like, just this little thing. So I was able to go in and be like, why were you feeling like that? What what is that feeling? I was like, oh, I was a little bit angry. Okay, where's anger at in my history with mm. my origin, my family of origin? Where did anger come up? How was I kind of like 
needed to be territorial to survive in a way. So it's just this beautiful, like, this is what I call the dance with life. So if you meet a guru, if you meet someone who has arrived, um, red flag, and if someone is uh, doing this work and is like, oh, I, you know, I'm always loving life, red flag. Because yeah. It takes real ability to both look at the shadow, look at, you know, these, these unappetizing parts of us and love all the parts, right? Mm. And this is where you can start to be like, I noticed that I just got a little bit niche about that water bottle instead of disregarding it and dismissing myself. Um, once I started to hold this part of me with compassion about this damn water bottle, um, literally a week later, I saw the same thing happen and I literally just smiled to myself holding that part of me that normally would have been like, I'm going to fight someone. This is my territory. You yeah. Know? And Such a I think response. we find it's so easy to just avoid the way that we're feeling. I mean, in the years that I've been doing all the reading and, you know, uh, finding out more about how to actually uh, figure out what's going on inside of myself, I find that it's easy to let those things pass. Like you have a thought and you know it should be, you should be paying a little bit more attention to it, but we find distractions so we don't have to go and deal with those things. And now we've got COVID-19, which is a distraction. So we're watching the news all day as opposed to dealing with the triggers that come up every day. Um, but for me, like, I'm telling you the the journey is never ending. And like you were saying earlier that if someone says they've made it, it's a red flag. And it took me a whole year to realize that because there's no way you end this journey. You are consciously, you need to be consciously aware of the fact that this is going to be until the day you die. And yeah. that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to die having known everything in the world, because even the gurus of the world don't know it all. And our journeys are all so specific and so beautiful in its own right. And we need to be more accepting of that. And I love your stories and, and, and what you talk about on your Instagram specifically because of that so i'm hoping in this lifetime i can afford your course <laughs> oh, i just wanted to read a comment from someone who, who coached with you she says thank you jessica for showing me the journey just the other day you opened my eyes to a behavior that i was doing so much of body self-checking is due to anxiety i'm i'm a victim i'm guilty yeah. um you know that, that's the other thing like this is really in closing, but the one thing that I, I you spoke about, um, like a lot about how you look externally and how easy it is for people to be more accepting because you're beautiful aesthetically and you, you, your body can be a certain way. Um, but I find for people like me in particular, when I started on this journey, I was like, okay, so I'm going to fix everything. Everything that is broken, I'm just going to flip it and it's going to come right. And, you know, I'm never going to have this problem again. But I find that, we like, all know how that worked out for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I kept gaining weight because I like food. But my thing is, I, I find that this, this, this weight loss culture damages, damages us so much that we struggle to identify who we are separate from it. And that's been my struggle for the last year. Do I want to be a certain weight because of I, I, I'd like to be aesthetically more beautiful or whatever the case may be? Um, and then it, it, it evolved to I have sciatica and all sorts of pain issues um, that I need to deal with if I'm at a larger size. And then I have to think about the compliments I got when I was smaller and how people love the fact that I was thinner. We've been in lockdown now for uh, just over five weeks and I've gained, I think for you, that would be seven pounds. Um, and I'm looking a lot tubbier, but I was enjoying the food. And then my mom came here the other day and she walked up the driveway and was like, oh, you've gained so much weight. And I was like, whoa, it switched me back to that. Okay, I need to get back on the weight loss journey, you know, because I, I, I'm obviously now not perfect or beautiful. How do you get out of that cycle? Because I think that cycle is, it's, it's thrown in our faces constantly. It's on the TV, it's on our cell phones, it's in our family conversations. My family... Uh, is very big on weight. I mean, to the point where I was 11 years old and my, my aunt measured my thigh against hers to check if mine was bigger at 11. You know, so that kind of really, you know, 
and I know where the trauma is in that area is, but it, it, the separating your mind from what you know you need to be doing and actually follow th- following through with it authentically, for me personally, has been very difficult. And I see a lot of my friends struggle with the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is a really great question. So starting to create boundaries, which are really difficult with your families, mm. um, people who comment on your weight or comments on how you look, um, just a simple statement of, you know, I'd, I'd prefer if you don't comment on my weight, it's not up for discussion. Um, I had to actually set a boundary with Scarlett's dad saying the same thing. Um, he would comment on, and he was, he thought he was being funny. I'm like, it's not funny if two people aren't laughing. He would comment on my hair or mm-hmm. when my hair was short and curly after I took my dreads out. Um, it was, he's like, oh, you've got soccer mom hair now. And I'm like, from now on, um, you're not allowed to comment on my body or how I look um, while you're in my house or in front of our daughter. I I won't allow it. Um, And you might get a lot of pushback, especially if it's so deep entrenched in your family, but these boundaries need to be set so that this is literally how we teach people how to love us more. And Mm. so if someone is resistant to that, then we can really start to Put them in categories of this is either a safe person to be around or it's not a safe person to be around people are always going to have so much to say about how we look i have a question that someone asked me you know she was a tomboy growing up and now she wants to like wear a pretty dress like this and even this this is like so different from how i used to dress um so when you start to look different or be different how do you deal with the incoming the influx of like the mm. gallery so to speak um even like this color is not something that i um historically would have worn it would have been more like a pink or a blush but it's like news flash at any point anyone can start being anything they want you, you know, want to be could cut all my hair off or grow it out i could make dye it you know um and so as long as we're uh, continually changing how we show up in the world based on responses from people around us. Um, we're living for attachment instead of living for authenticity. When wow. we're younger, attachment is number one. We literally have to be attached to our caregivers, even if they're the most toxic individuals. And mm. It begets a lot of trauma, right? So we have to be attached when we're younger. This very attachment that if it doesn't allow for authenticity when we're younger creates trauma and creates uh, unhealthy coping mechanisms. When we're older then, the point of therapy, the point of coaching that I do and the point of the work is to promote the authentic self. And so in the promotion of the authentic self, attachment takes care of itself. So previously, when I used to date people, I'd be like, who do you need me to be? Do you like me to wear a lot of makeup, a little makeup? Do you like long hair or short hair or blonde hair? Oh, yeah. You know, like just uh, like a day in the life of dating as Jessica Scott was like so exhausting because Mm. I had to see how you needed me to show up. How does my mom want me to show up? How does this guy like what? That was crazy. And instead, if we start to revert it and start to turn it around and say, I'm going to promote authenticity in every moment for me. Mm. And then the vibes that I'm sending out by being myself, looking like how I want to look, having 20 pounds extra on me or whatever, when I promote this authentic self, I'm going to stand here in my sacredness and see who's still around. This is a lot easier said than done because it means that people are going to be moving away from you, right? Yeah. But some of the most treacherous arenas that I've had to walk through in losing friends, losing losing partners, and I was with Scarlett's dad for eleven years, you know, Um, even if it was, but it wasn't like it wasn't a one night stand. This was like an eleven year relationship until I started to promote my authentic self. So with family, with whomever you're with, with friends, the moment you uh, deem yourself as sacred and ever changing and who am I today, this allows people and it's been, I'm totally the example of this. When I've been my authentic self, the most beautiful and nourishing and emotionally intelligent relationships have showed up because I've 
said, I will not continue to uh, go after attachment. Attachment happens on its own as a result yes. of me showing up and then you show up and we're like, wow, look at that. Um, do you know how exhausted, it, it's effortless almost, right? <laughs> Um, but we get it wrong because we're so used to having to vie for someone's yes. love or attention or be how they needed us to be. And so my work and a lot of your work and the work of therapy and this journey is to really promote the authentic self. I'm getting goosebumps because that has been my experience. And you know, I, what I find so amazing is that the smaller your circle becomes, the more authentically connected you are to the people who speak to who you know, you yeah. authentically are. And that has happened to me. I mean, I have two really close friends yeah. who I otherwise would have never even imagined. But the funny thing is our relationship doesn't involve attachment. If I don't speak to you, it's okay. We are still so connected when we do speak to one another. And I think that is the most vital part. We feel like we need to be in relationships for the sake of being in them because it means that we are loved a certain way. But if you truly understand your authentic self, you don't necessarily need that from an external source. Your internal understanding of yourself kind of draws the relationships you need to push you forward. Okay, before I start preaching, um, <laughs> thank you so much I, like there's some things that you said i'm definitely gonna have to watch again because it sits with me and i don't i only get goosebumps when i have revelation moments and you've really really opened up a few for me and i hope for the people who are watching as well i really feel like you know when i visit my friend in miami i'm coming to chicago because we need to do this live but um thank you so much say hi to scarlett i hope she's enjoying school <laughs> online thank you so much for having me this was so great we should do it again for sure. yeah we definitely should and I'm, I'm hoping that i can do your coaching at some point in this year um but also we've been talking a lot this is just from me um there are people that i know need to write books and you are one of those people oh, um i really you. feel like there's so much information and insight that people are not aware of it and, and they need to be following you to see some of this insight. You've grown so much and there, there are revelations that come through a lot of what you say. So I'm, I'm hoping for a book, but <laughs> thank you so thank much. You. This is going to go on YouTube. Um, and then everyone who's missing the live now can watch it there. Um, guys follow Jessica. She's on Instagram. You will not regret it. I promise oh, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So have a good rest of your day. Um, we will chat. Thanks okay. so much. All right. Bye. Bye.